Okay, today we're going to start with chapter 15, and today we're going to go over chapter 15, 16, 17, and 18. This material is going to be the last of the material that's going to be covered on your second exam. Your second exam is next week, so the material from today is going to be on there. Again, when I tell you to obviously write something down, write it down. After today's lecture, uh, I'm going to go through my notes and I'm going to work on the exam to start preparing what material we covered, what we focused on. Um, that way, next week when you have your exam, it's all stuff from the lectures. I always test on things from the lectures. I would say 90-95% of the questions, as you've seen, are things that are from the le lecture um, directly, which obviously the lectures draw upon the material in the textbook and the syllabus and whatnot. The exam, I'm not sure yet how many questions it's going to be. It's going to be less than the first exam, uh, probably maybe around 25 multiple choice and maybe around 10 true and false around that. But I'll um, send you an email uh, if you'd like. I'll send you an email prior to next week so you have that. And as soon as we finish, I will try to post this video on YouTube and send it to you guys as a blackboard that we also have that for reference when you're preparing for the exam next week. If you have any questions on materials from the past few classes, which starts with chapter nine. So anything from chapter nine to the stuff that we're going to cover today is going to be on your exam. There's not going to be anything from that first trifecta of the material that we covered in the semester that's not going to be so there's not going to be anything on our wills there's not going to be anything on criminal law any of that stuff it's going to be from chapter nine to the material that we cover today which ends with chapter 18. okay all right nobody's saying anything so i'm just gonna keep going um Okay, so today we're going to start with chapter 15, which is contracts in writing. And I don't know if you recall, but we had spoken about, you know, oral contracts. And we said that oral contracts can be enforceable, right? But it depends on the type of contract that it is. Some contracts must be in writing in order for them to be enforceable. And, you know, even if you didn't know anything about contracts and you didn't know uh, anything about the material or you didn't have any background information, give me some reasons why it's better to have something in writing. And I think we already kind of touched upon this in earlier classes, but why would you think it's better to put something in writer, writing, even if it didn't have to be in writing, why would you want to put it in writing as opposed to just an oral contract? It's insurance, right? Say that again? You want insurance to, that the contract isn't going to be like disputed it right. just in case in emergencies or whatever. Right. Uh, somebody wrote evidence, right. You have something to fall back on in case you have to sue, in case there's miscommunication. You have something to refer to in case there is a misunderstanding. When you are doing a... Um, a contract or an agreement verbally, sometimes you're not really thinking things through. When you put stuff in writing, and I don't know if you've noticed that about any aspect of life, when you start putting pen to paper, you start analyzing and thinking things a little bit more thoroughly. And sometimes you can anticipate, well, what if this doesn't happen? What if that happens? You kind of come up with contingencies. And the more you think about it, the more it's in writing. And then the more you can discuss it with this person you're entering into an agreement with, that way you have a plan of, if this happens, this is what we're going to do. If that happens, this is what we're going to do. You're not leaving it up to chance. You're trying to think of as many scenarios as possible. But with that said, there are some types of contracts that must be in writing in order for them to be enforceable. The book gives you five. I like to go over the ones that are um, uh more, I think, more relevant or more important. So I'm going to give you the five in your chat, and I'm going to tell you which ones I want you to really know. So let's go here. Okay, so the first one I put down is promises to answer for the duty of another. If you're going to take on somebody else's debt, you, that has to be in writing. So let's say I enter into a contract with you and I owe you 
uh, if it's student loans, if I'm bringing somebody else to pay my student loans for me, that person must sign off. That cannot be an oral agreement between us. So when somebody's going to step in to the, somebody else's shoes, that must be in writing. That third party, their negotiation or their end of the deal must be put in writing in order for it to be enforceable. Number two, promises of an executor or an administrator to answer personally for a duty of the decedent. That should kind of ring some bells. When we spoke about wills and administrations when somebody dies, that, that executor that you name in your will, that has to be put in writing. When the court says one person is going to be the administrator, the fiduciary, the court's not going to say, okay, I pick you, you you're going to be in charge of so-and-so's estate. That has to be in writing, whether it's through a petition, whether it's through certificates or something, that's got to be put in writing. Uh, now it's th this next one I want you to know, it's kind of common sense, but I'm going to, I want you, I'm going to emphasize this one. Agreements upon consideration of marriage. When two people are going to get married, that must be put in writing, some kind of uh, memorialization of that relationship. So oftentimes people go to city hall. Uh, if they're going to do a religious ceremony, there's also something where it's being signed and it's an agreement between those two parties. So that has to be put in writing. The next one is the most important one. That's the one I want you to know. Number five, I don't care about, but number four, I want you to know the transferring of interest in land. And this may ring a bell, we might have discussed this already. Whenever you're buying or selling an interest in real property, that must be done in writing. You cannot sell or buy a house based on a handshake. That's not enforceable. Even if you have gone through all the terms, it must be in writing in order for it to be enforceable. The last one, I'm going to kind of just gloss over it, agreements not to be performed within a year. If there's going to be an agreement between two parties for a particular service or some kind of performance, if it's going to take more than one year, that must be in writing. So if I'm hiring you to build a building, obviously, if it's a building, it's real estate. So we're going to, you know, we're going to have that also as a contract. But anything that's going to take more than a year, that also must be done. Um, in writing. But again, I need you to focus on just number three, most importantly, number four, that's really the one that you need to know. Does anybody have any questions on these? Yeah, I have a question for number sure. three. Um, sure. But how, where does common law come in? Isn't that something too with marriage? Uh, it is. I don't know enough about common law uh, to actually, you know, give you a straight answer. I don't know if it's like a domestic partnership. I don't know if it's like when people hold themselves out to be if that's sufficient. Um, and I think it's more like for the splitting of property that it comes into play. So usually when people are married, it has a lot of interplay on their financial assets. So I think that's why those types of agreements need to be in writing. Persons that are common law marriage, I don't know what the implications of that is. So if there was an argument about who gets what assets or who has a right to, you know, speak up on the person's um, health care decisions, I don't know the weight that common law marriage holds. Okay. No, I just always heard about it. So I've I heard about it too, but I never actually like researched it. If it's important okay. to you, I will look into it and get back to you. Just shoot me an email so I remember. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so also different states have different, may, may say that there's different other relationships that must be in writing uh, to be enforced. Those are just general things that are kind of common, uh, but those generally are the ones that need to be in writing in order for them to be enforceable. Um, let me see here. Oh, do you want your provision? Okay. Uh, who read and would like to tell us about the estate of Jackson versus Devons? I couldn't find it in the book. Yeah, I couldn't find, find it either, but I, I, I looked it up if you wanted to talk about it. Um, which, which, which version are you, the people that did not see it in there? Uh, whatever the latest, the, whatever the version on the syllabus is. I have the 13th. The 13th. I think I'll it's on the right 12th, now. but if it's not on the 13th, then um, I won't hold you accountable for that. Yeah. Uh, Jessica, you said you read it, you found it. 
I, I found it online. Yeah. So I can talk about it if you want. Yeah. Talk about it just so because it highlights a, a certain principle, but I won't, I'll make a note for myself not to test on that case. So go ahead, Jess. Okay. So uh, basically Jackson uh, wanted to gradually sell 79 acres of land, including machinery to the Devons uh, for about $120,000 while still retaining a one acre uh, around his property. Uh, they agreed to that, um, but then Jackson died prematurely and the Devons appealed to maintain the agreement, but the contract was unenforceable because the property was not sufficiently described under Wyoming state law because it couldn't meet the statute of frauds. Excellent. Very good. Again, it goes into whether something is in writing, whether or not it's specific. When we talk, has anybody here ever bought a house or a piece of property, mostly land? Francine, I see you shaking your head because there's only like three people on the screen that I can see. So um, can you tell us if you recall when you purchased, thank you, Jessica. Thank you. Um, if, when you purchased your home, do you remember um, what the D oh, looked like? Papers. It's it was like, a million papers. That's right. Do you remember the description of the land? Do you remember um, anything? Specific lot sizes. Um, um, Do you uh, remember the latitude, longitude? It has like yeah, all these points. Yeah, all the points. That, yeah. Exactly. So when you're buying a piece of property, like uh, there's a title report and all these, like there's like tons and tons of paperwork and it will tell you like, you know, from this Southern part to this Northern part where they intersect and point it, you know, like they have all these numbers, it's like latitude and longitude on a map. And so when, again, it's when it goes back to that purchasing and selling of property, it has to be exact. It's going to have that address. It's going to have the block and lot. It's going to have where um, your land is and where your neighbor starts. And sometimes, you know, neighbors end up fighting because let's say, you know, neighbor one and two had an unspoken agreement. Yeah, you can put your fence on my land, right? And then, you know, one party sells their you know, house and a new neighbor comes in. And then when they get these papers, they actually realize, oh, wait, my land goes up to this, you know, this point, and that's an extra foot of space, or it's an extra six inches or whatever it is. And so then it's up to them to now try to enforce in it. And sometimes it creates problems, because even though one neighbor has been used to using that foot, they don't, it's not theirs. So um, it just creates litigation and all that stuff. So land has to be exact. <coughs> and Excuse me. yes, when you sell your house, if you put on like an extension or some a deck even attached to the house, that's a problem for, on sale for the um, D2. Don't you think? It, yeah, if it's not done with um, uh, permission from the yeah. building department and if it's not up to code, you're going to have to like get rid of that before you can yeah. even sell it or market it unless you're selling it to an all cash buyer. If you're going to have a mortgage and they're going to come in and do an inspection and all that jazz, then they're going to see it's not up to code. It's not on the building plans. It's not anything and you're going to have to tear it down. I remember there's a one house that I had seen um on staten island and uh, we were just looking for houses at that that time and it had a pool in the backyard but when we went to actually look into it the realtor said that's going to have to come out unless you're doing an all cash purchase because it was put in there without the proper permissions and it's not up to code so yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah and so um it's you know, most people, and I'm not going to say for all, when they're buying a home, they're taking out a mortgage on that. They're not going to be able to afford a price of a home all cash, especially on Staten Island. So that's, you know, a, a hard sell. So either the seller will make concessions. That's why they could reduce the, the price or whatnot. Um, but those are kind of the things to, to watch out for. And you always want to get an inspection, obviously, get a title report. You want to make sure you have a clean title that transferring a property because you don't want to buy a piece of property, then find out that the person who's selling it to you did not have the authority to sell. I've seen some of those cases in the court that I work in where there was actually one case, there was, I don't remember if the, the real estate was in Staten Island or if it was in Brooklyn, but grandma, we're going to stick with grandma. Grandma owned a house. Grandma had a will. She left the house to her grandchildren, okay? She specifically gave the house to her grandchildren. Grandma's kids, which is one was the father of these kids and the aunt, decided to sell the house to a third party. 
the, the grandkids ended up suing the father and their aunt because that house was supposed to go to them. But those people now, those third party purchasers who bought this house, now they're in this litigation. They bought this house. They don't know whether or not they're actually going to be able to keep it. Uh, there's this thing of the law called like, you know, bona fide purchasers, whether or not they knew about this or whatnot. And I don't know. I mean, this thing went on for years and years. So again, when you're buying a home, you want to get that title report. You want to make sure that there's clean title. Otherwise, you could hold that title company responsible for not for not making sure that the proper parties, you know, sold the house what, if they actually had the authority to sell that home. There's another caveat with real estate. And again, that's not, this is none of this is on your exam, but this is just like, you know, FYI, you know, life. Real property passes at death by operation of law. You don't actually need to go to court or anything like that. But if there's a will, like this particular case I just mentioned, and the will specifically devises, gives that piece of property to somebody else, it throws off who is supposed to get this property and who's actually the owner of it. So that's why title companies sometimes make people go to surrogate's court, that's where I work, to, to have the court determine who the proper owners are before they can sell or transfer pieces of property. So just, you know, fun facts, fun facts, fun facts. It was actually, um, even when, because uh, earlier last year, my fiance and I were looking to buy a house and realized it was way too expensive on Staten Island. Mm -hmm. But one of the houses that we were looking at had this really, really amazing deck in the backyard but it was very, very high up. Like you can see over the fence. So we, you know, we didn't know anything. So we were like looking into like, okay, like what needs a permit? So we were asking them like, oh, does the de did the deck have all its permits? And they were like, basically, if you don't ask, no one will look into it. And I was like, that's not a real answer. Yeah. That's not a real answer. Yeah, because it's like when you're actually now going through the process, you're already paying for the inspection. You don't know what the mortgage company is going to say. And there's like some parts, like some people have that like, you know, oh, don't ask, don't tell, um, you know, it's not going to be a problem. Well, what if, you know, what if then you're going to have to be their that problem. Whole structure. Be my yeah. problem. <laughs> exactly. It's going to be your problem and you're going to have to deal with it. Yeah. So always a good idea to do things on the up and up just to make sure that things are good. Yeah. Um, also, um, this is, this is the last, actually, again, today also is pretty short, um, lecture because it's not that much material. Um, the last thing I want to tell you in, in this chapter is something about the parole evidence rule. And the parole okay. evidence rule is a very interesting legal theory. And the parole evidence rule says, you know, when you're enter, I'm going to explain it. And then you can kind of write it in whichever way you want to. I'll see if I can give you the, actually, let me see if I have here. Um, yeah. When you are entering into an agreement with somebody, you usually go back and forth, right? Offer an acceptance, you're going back and forth, you're negotiating certain terms, and it's there's a lot of back and forth between the parties. The parole evidence rule says that after all is said and done, whatever is on the four corners of the document is your agreement. Don't tell me you had a side deal. Don't tell me your understanding was, you know, X, Y, and Z based on this other conversation you had. Because a contract is the total sum of whatever's in writing. Anything else extraneous doesn't matter. So the parole evidence rule is that theory that says any prior oral or written negotiations, does, they don't matter. It's only whatever is in the four corners of that document. Because the document will often say, if you've ever entered into a contract, it'll have towards the end of it, this agreement is the uh, complete understanding of both parties. Besides this, there's nothing else that was supposed to be exchanged between the parties. And this is it. Sometimes it'll have exhibits, you know, sometimes a contract will refer to exhibit A, exhibit B, uh, or an addendum or things of that sort. Those are still within, those still count as part of the contract, but you can't rely on a conversation you had. Oh, and I'll give you an example, just and we'll stick with real estate. So let's say you find a house um, and uh, it was listed for $1.2 million. You tell the seller, um, all right, why don't we put down that 
um, you're going to sell it to me for 990000 because I don't want to have to pay the extra taxes and I'll pay you $100,000 or $200,000 on the side. So you'll get your money and I don't have to pay taxes on it. All right, the other side agrees. So you enter into an agreement, the purchase price, the sale price is for that 995. Now the sale is done, they're moving in, sellers like, where's the rest of my money? I don't know what you're talking about. We don't have anything in writing, uh -huh. right? You're not gonna put something in writing usually because you're trying to evade taxes. So that's not a good idea to do. So now this person who is selling their home for $200,000 less who is banking on this side agreement is now SOL. Right. So whatever agreements you have are going to be in that document, make sure all the terms are in that document, uh, in that contractual agreement. If there's something that you had, um, anything that you had referenced or maybe a first draft, second draft, third draft, again, the law assumes that you've gone through all the negotiations and your final draft, that final contractual piece is that final agreement between the two parties. So that's what's going to stand in a court of law. Okay. All right. So that is it for chapter 15. I'm going to move on to chapter 16. I just want to take a look at the syllabus quick. Um, oh, I didn't, I didn't tell you about promissory estoppel. Oh, I love promissory estoppel. Hold on. Yes. yes. Uh, the, the first five in the in the chat, what is that underneath? Like the promises that we need? Oh, those are the things that have to be done in writing. Those are items that must be in writing in order for them to be in, enforceable. In order for it to be a contract? Enfor yeah, in order for it to be an enforceable, it's not in order to be a contract, you can have oral agreements as well, but in order for it to be an, an enforceable contract, those items must be in writing. Mm -hmm. Thank so you. you're welcome. Um, promissory estoppel is, um, I'll actually give you that definition because it's just a straight up like definition. Hold on. So, okay, promissory estoppel is, Remember that case that we had with Skeba versus Cash where justifiable reliance on one when somebody relies on a promise? So that's promissory estoppel. The court will assume a, uh, a contract existed um, if one party relied on that promise and the court wants to avoid injustice by enforcing it. So that's the only time that a court will enforce an oral contract. So let me put that in your chat as well. So this is promissory estoppel. Oral contracts will be enforced if one party justifiably relied on the promise and the court uh, want to avoid injustice can only do so by enforcement. Okay, so that takes care of chapter 15. Now we're gonna move on to chapter 16. Chapter 16, I, I don't spend that much time actually on chapter 16 only because it's about third party rights. So the only thing, you know, briefly, a, a third party to a contract, what is, what's a third party to a contract and how do you involve a third party uh, in a contract? So a contract is what? Usually an agreement between two parties. So how do you bring a third party into it? Sometimes you can assign right, assign a duty or a delegation to a, um, a third party. You bring a third party in there by assigning them a particular task. Sometimes you delegate certain duties to them. And sometimes a contract will just by its very nature involve a third party. So that's how you involve a third party in there. You assign a portion of the contract to somebody else, meaning somebody has a duty or an obligation to do X, Y, or Z. Um, just, you know, delegate the duties. Okay, you know, person C, you have to do X, Y, and Z in order for this contract to kind of come together. Or um, C, uh, the third thing is that there's terms in the contract that spell out um, the, this uh, agreement, uh, including a third party. When we talk about an assignment, this is a write it down moment. There's only one requirement in an assignment and that's intent. So if I ask you, if I were to ask you what is the requirement? What is the only requirement of an assignment? Intent. 
as long as that intent to assign somebody is there, then you've just did an assignment. There are, however, certain rights that cannot be assigned. And I'm going to give you some examples. Let's say um, I'm an artist and you hired me to paint a picture of your family. I am world renowned. So you're paying me whatever my rate is so I can draw your family portrait. Can I assign this, this duty, this you know, contractual agreement to my understudy? No. No, I cannot. You specifically hired me to do this uh, piece of art. Sometimes art is not something that you can assign because it could be considered highly personal. I'll give you another example. Let's say I, um, it was discovered that I have this awful brain tumor and it requires a highly skilled physician to be able to go in the brain, cut the skull and remove this tumor. I do a lot of research. I found a doctor who uh, is in California. I book, I go there. It's the day of my surgery. And he has a resident there to perform the surgery because he called out sick. He's not gonna be able to do it or he's sending in his partner to do it. Is that something that I would agree to? No. no. No, oh. hell no. As a matter of fact, I will tell you, my husband is an OBGYN. I didn't want any resident or anybody to kind of come in. I was like, they're learning on their own time. That's wonderful. God bless. But I don't want them to learn on me. And that's OBGYN. Most of the time, if you, and I'm, I apologize because the gentleman here won't know this, but if you go to a doctor, sometimes, you know, and you're pregnant, a doctor an office has a lot of different doctors in it. So as a patient, you're going to see different physicians because you're not going to know who's on call, who's going to be delivering you. So that, unless it's a, um, a, a special skill set or whatnot, then any physician with that specialty uh, is able to deliver you. Most patients obviously want their particular doctor, the one they've seen most, but with OBGYN or with internal medicine or things of that sort, or like an ear doctor, or ophthalmologist, it's a general thing. You don't need somebody specific. The last example I'm going to give you is you, you watch a lot of commercials. You see that there is a, um, a, uh, all these commercials for Selena or Bar and Barnes or, you know, Johnny Cochran, all these high, um, you know, specialized law firms. You feel like you have a case, you go there. And now um, the case is on for a status conference or a, a, um, an adjournment, which means that they're going to just delay the date for something an extra week. You find out that it wasn't the, the lawyer that you hired. It wasn't Johnny Cochran. It wasn't Salino and Barnes, but it was an associate. Is that something that you could potentially have a gripe against? Yes. No. no, because I said this was for just an adjournment or a status conference. If, however, if it was for the trial, then you could say, listen, I hired you. The reason I came to your firm is because I wanted you to do the trial. When you have like, I don't want to say like pro forma work, like an adjournment, like status conferences, things that are not, you know, that serious, you could have an associate, you can have somebody kind of on the lower a junior associate to do those types of work, because it doesn't require that special skill set. And this is now for real, the, the last example I give you, let's say, you know, two people contract to marry one another, because remember, I told you marriage is just a contract, it's an agreement between two people, you know, so can one party decide to assign the task of marriage to somebody else? <laughs> I'm not going to be able to do it. Can you step in my place? That's a no. So those are things that are highly personal. You cannot assign. Imagine, imagine that would be just <laughs> wonderful. So um, again, with assignment, you cannot assign something that's highly personal or expressly prohibited kind of keep that in mind. Uh, let me just see here. 16. In Ray Magnus, did you, was that in your textbook or no? Yes, it was. All right. Would you like to tell us about it? Briefly? Uh, I believe it had to do with uh, this country club that had 
like a normal membership. And then for golfing, like to golf on the country club, you had to go on a waiting list and they would pick you to, uh, you know, if you got a golfing membership. And I believe someone named Magnus died and uh, they were trying to see if they can assign their memberships to other people Mm -hmm. outside of the waiting list, I think. Mm -hmm. And the court, I think the court didn't affirm it. And the court said, no, you can't do that. That's right. So um, I learned this as I, you know, I grow up and um, be amongst more people in life. Um, So like, there's like country clubs and all these like, you know, social clubs or whatnot. You can't just go and be like, oh, I want to be a member of your club. There are some clubs, there are some organizations where you have to go through a whole membership application. People have to, you know, uh, you know, put your name around, see if you have any conflict, you know, what's your reputation like, how much money do you have, um, things of that sort. So things like that, you're not going to be able to sign. So if you are a member of, I don't know, like the Richmond County Country Club or something, I don't think you can take that and just, oh, my neighbor wants to come in. I'm going to just give him my thing. I'm going to just, or, you know, or give it to my cousin once removed. There's an application process and that you, you know, this club or this organization kind of decides who comes in who's a member and who's not. Uh, yeah, so uh, yes. most, most country clubs, I've worked in a lot of country clubs, uh, tell me more because it's like a whole new thing. I don't know anything about it really. I, I I'm did not a, a member if you can't tell. I did a event production. I did like live uh, oh. sound work for like bands. And I did a lot of weddings at country clubs. Cool. And they're very pretentious, very, you know, kind of old money waspy. So it's it's like I would be working at these don't country clubs. Don't hold back, Carmine, please. No, no. It'd be like you'd be working at these country clubs. And it's like if you're not making at least like a couple million a year, you're not getting in. Yeah, you know, so and some it, of them are very gross. Richmond County Country Club is fucking disgusting. Okay, this is being recorded and that's paid, fine. So, nope, don't you um this is a person's opinion. You don't want to be sued for any type of misspeaking. So nah, the kitchen is gross. Okay, that's enough. Stop talking, Carmine. So um so that's that's this type of assignment those are the things that you can't do good job on the case of in ray magnus i highly doubt anybody from the mechanic country club is watching these videos so we're kind of okay um with that so also uh, don't forget that when you delegate certain duties right we said that you can delegate you can assign tasks to somebody else the tasks that are assigned they must be legal in nature so you cannot decide uh to tell your associate or your administrative assistant to kill someone on your behalf uh, so you can kill a deal, right? You can't. So anything that they partake in must be legal in nature in order for it to be uh, okay and effective. That I believe, ladies and gentlemen, is the last thing I want you to know for chapter 16. We are moving right along. Chapter 17 is performance, breach, and discharge. So let me go back here. Okay. So when we talk about, again, contracts, sometimes inside those contracts are conditions or contingent actions. You know, this will happen if this happens. So I will buy your car and I will pay you the $5,000 as long as it has less than 10,000 miles on it or 100,000 miles on it. So you're saying I will buy this vehicle. I will enter into this contract with you as long as X, Y, and Z happens. So there are conditions that can be built into contracts. Let's go with real estate, for example. So you enter into a contract for a purchase of a piece of property. A lot of times in that beginning, you're writing the contract, you're starting the process, but it's contingent upon uh, maybe the purchaser securing a mortgage or the purchaser doing a home inspection and confirming that this house is okay, that it's built. In Jessica's case, what she mentioned, perhaps when she did the inspection, she find out that, you know, that deck was not done up to code so she would have been able to get out of that contract so you have these conditions built in that give you an out if certain things are not met those are conditions and conditions can be a number of things um obviously depends on the type of agreement that it is 
when you also have a um, contract, sometimes you also could have a breach of a contract, right? Um, hold on, let me just see. Actually, you know, what, let me do the satisfaction. This is this is a concept I want you to know, and that's satisfaction of a contracting party. Let me put this in here. I need. I want you to know this because I always test on this. I think it's fun. So I'm going to just give you the the title, and I want you to know this: satisfaction of a contracting party. If I hired, remember I said before, like if you hire somebody um, or you hired me to paint your picture, the family portrait, if there's a clause in our contractual agreement that you must be satisfied in order for you to pay, it is completely based on whether or not you're satisfied. So if you're not satisfied with my artwork, then you don't have to pay. If you are the purchaser of this particular item or this agreement, and it's based on your satisfaction, obviously that's wonderful for you to have that particular clause in there. But if you're the person who is, you know, performing the action, the artwork, or, you know, the duties bound upon you, and you're not going to get paid until the other side is satisfied, that could really be problematic. So what if it's just a matter of taste? And you've done, you know, 10 renditions of this piece of artwork and this purchaser is still not satisfied. Is it reasonable for you to keep going? Or what if you breach the contract? What if you say, you know, what, I don't want to do this anymore. And then, there, you know, you're going back and forth. No, but I hired you to do it. But how many times are you going to go back and forth between this person? What if I um, hired a contractor to build or put down the floor in my house? and have this clause in there that I must be satisfied before I pay them. Well, what if there was, you know, two tiles or two pieces of wood that were not done correctly and one piece of tile maybe was uh, a, a little bit higher than the other. If I'm not satisfied, they're going to have to do it again. What if I hire somebody to paint something and that's not to my satisfaction? Are they obligated to do it again? So satisfaction of a contracting party is a clause that would be put into a contract that basically says if that one side who's usually making the purchase is not satisfied, they don't have to pay. And then the other side has to kind of keep going until they satisfy them. So that's an important concept to know. I feel um, like it, it, you know, like I understand why that would be a thing, but yeah. also like it seems way too easy to commit fraud on the purchaser side. It's it's like, it's very easy to screw. Unfair. Yeah. But again, you want to think of it in um why are people entering into an agreement with one another because they want to work together they're not trying to screw the other side but if you have somebody that's really like you know a pain um it's it's not good and i'll actually give you a real life example of this this is something i went through i wasn't i think i was in law school at that time and I worked for a company, right? It was a litigation funding company. And what they did was they hired a website company to build their website. And, you know, first draft came in and the, the owner was like, ah, I don't want this. I don't like these colors. I don't like this design. And it was based on, I mean, like the, the web creator, she did this based on the initial interview and paperwork that, you know, he had filled out. She must have done like, I don't even know how many drafts of this website. And he was still not satisfied. Finally, she said to me, she's like, listen, I, you know, I do this, there's a certain number of drafts I do. And then after that, you're going to have to pay extra. And it kind of caused a little bit of friction now between them because he's like, no, I'm paying. I should be totally satisfied uh, with the product I'm getting. And then, but it's got to be done within reason. So again, are you going to argue between back and forth with this? Um, it, it's, it could be abused, certainly. And so you want to be able to hire somebody or enter into a contract with somebody. If you're the person performing the duty, you want to build in up to three drafts, up to five drafts. You know, um, you don't want to lose a customer. You don't want to have bad reviews, right? Especially nowadays with everything being, you know, going online. But you also, it has to be fair to you and the things that you're doing and your talent. And when it's based on somebody's, you know, perception of what's good or what's not or what's creative and what isn't, it could, it could lend itself to, to certain abuses, certainly. Professor? Yes. I have a question. Sure. Uh, can you uh, talk more about a promissory uh, estoppel? That was a while back, David. I mean, I, I moved on from that. Um, so no, it's just, it's I, not, I, I wrote it down everything. It's just not clear to me. Like, 
Okay. Yeah. So That's... promissory estoppel is like a legal theory when the court will enforce an oral contract because it's the right thing to do, essentially. Okay. Um... So think of the case Skeba versus Cash. Remember where there was unjustifiable reliance on a particular contract and it was an oral contract, but the court found that if they didn't enforce this contract, it wouldn't be fair mm -hmm. one side relied on that. That's the theory of promissory estoppel. It's making a contract when a contract did not exist. Okay. Make Thank sense? You. You're welcome. Yeah. Okay. So going back to the chapter that we're on, and let me just see here, where were we? Okay, uh, also now we're talking chapter 17, which is performance, breach, and discharge. Now we're gonna go to breach. If one party you know, doesn't do their end of a contract, that's basically breach. So there could then be a lawsuit because one side didn't do what they were supposed to do. And when that happens, then there's liability. And so if there's a lawsuit, it could be based on a number of things, but all right, you sue somebody. How do you get compensated? How do you get made whole? And that's really what the court looks like. The court looks at, had the contract gone through, what would you have come out with? And that's what they would try to pay you for or compensate you for. Had the contract been concluded, what would you have gotten out of it? So the point is when we're, there's a breach of contract, how do you make one party whole? When we also talk about express conditions, express conditions, it's when a condition is clearly laid out in a contract. So we talked about, remember, uh, express and implied and express condition is something specifically clearly laid out in a contract. And that way, you know, if this condition is met or if it's not met, whether or not uh, this contract will, will go through. Sometimes we have implied conditions. So uh, obviously if it's not expressed, it's implied. So if you say, you know, um, I'm going to paint, I'm hiring somebody to paint my house. I'm gonna provide all the paint. It goes without saying that I'm going to have to let them know obviously what color or I'm going to have to provide them the paint or they're not going to, if I tell them, oh, I just need you to paint my house, they're not going to know what paint or what type or what color I want. It's implied I'm going to give them more information. So I'm going to pay you to paint. Uh, I'm going to pay you $100 or $500, whatever it is, but there's going to be a little bit more than that. The nature of the contract, it's implied in there that I'm going to give you more information so you can perform your end of the deal. Let's see here what else. Uh, okay, so when we also now talk about discharge, so discharge means you're basically off the hook with the contract. The contract has concluded. So there's two types of discharge, either discharge by performance, meaning the both parties have fulfilled their obligation or discharge by breach, meaning one side or both sides did not do what they were supposed to do. So an example, a uh, discharge by performance is, again, it really goes to the people who've had, you know, homes, um, when you buy a home, you are also entering into a contract with a mortgage company, right? A bank. So the bank is actually an owner with you on that house until what? Until you paid off the mortgage. Once you've actually paid off the mortgage, they send you a discharge letter. You are now discharged your relationship with them. Same thing when you buy a car. If you bought a, bought a car and you had uh, purchased, um, you, you financed, you're going to keep paying the interest. But once you're paid off completely and there's no more relationship with you in the bank, they'll send you a discharge notice, meaning that lien that they had on this car, or this home or whatever, it's now lifted. It's discharged. You've paid all your obligation and you're free. Now, obviously, the other way that discharge happens, as I mentioned, is if you don't perform what you are supposed to do within that prescribed period of time. So clearly you have breached your contract and now either both sides are going to go their ways or there's going to be some kind of lawsuit to make that one party whole. So discharge by breach or discharge by performance. Um, material breach. I want you to know what material breach is. 
material breach is a substantial breach. It is a major breach in uh, contractual uh, obligation. So if I had a agreement with you for um, you painting my house, right? And I, I gave you the, um, I wanted you to color, my, you know, paint my house off white. Meanwhile, you did, you know, um, eggshell. It's not that major of a breach, right? You were within the family, you got eggshell and off-white, you know, corrected. But let's say I told you to paint this house off-white or eggshell. And meanwhile, you I come into my home and you have painted it a hot pink or black or, you know, neon green. Obviously, that's not what I wanted. That's not something I could live with. It's not something that I want. And so it's a material breach of the agreement between us. Another oh, example. Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, so would that be like you're explicitly going against what the contract says? Yeah, it's like you painted, right? Yeah. But you painted the wrong color. And so for, for the essence of this contract that we just have, you painting the right color was a major thing for me. I don't want to go into my home where it's, you know, mint green or whatever. Um, it's okay. like I hire somebody to do the flooring on my, in my, my floor, my home, and I wanted, a, you know, brown wood and I go in and they actually have like tile you know granite tile or something completely not what i wanted i hire a tailor to make me a um to build me a uh, i think uh you know a cotton uh dress and she uses rayon or nylon or something like that's not what i wanted that's a completely different thing that i wanted and so that's a material breach it's a big breach substantial terms of the contract being breached Um, okay, the last two things for this chapter, this is a listening, not a writing, it's frustration of purpose. Sometimes things happen and you are not able to um, uh, complete the actual, you know, agreement um, where it's nobody's fault of their own, but like, you know, whether a uh, perfect example right now, you know, people had been scheduled, obviously, to get married, you know, within the past year, Corona hit, nobody anticipated that, right? So you were not able to have your wedding in the dream hall that you wanted, and with all the flowers and all that stuff. Did you breach did the, the florist or the hall breach their contract by not allowing you to go in there and have your wedding? Did you breach your contract because you didn't go through with the date that you wanted? Both sides were not able to perform their end of the contract because there was an outside force that prevented them from happening. So it's not foreseeable. It's, it, it, it's um, both sides are kind of off the hook. And the last thing for this chapter is something you've, I'm sure, heard before. It's bankruptcy. And bankruptcy allows uh, persons or companies or entities to not have to pay their outstanding obligations if they declare bankruptcy. They no longer can pay their bills or whatnot. And so they're kind of asking for a clean slate from bankruptcy court. The problem is when you do that, you're not going to be able to buy anything with credit. You're going to have, you know, your credit's going to be shot for a number of years. So people who do that really should just be, you know, uh, as a as a last resort, because to do anything, you know, there's a credit check that's performed, right? So to actually declare bankruptcy, whether you're an individual or a business entity, you want to be make sure that that's what um, what's what uh, absolutely necessary to do. Uh, before I move on to chapter 18, I want to give you the secret phrase for the evening. So the secret phrase for today is, I love to eat apples and bananas. <laughs> That's actually a song for from little kids. So I'm going to write. Go melon. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> we have that playing all the time. Go melon. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let me write it down. So the, I have to, before I forget. So I love to eat apples. I love to eat apples and bananas. That's once again, the secret phrase for tonight, March 17, 2021. I love to eat apples and bananas. This is for 
the lessons on these chapters. One more time. Last time, I love to eat apples and bananas. And now we're going to go on to our final chapter for the evening, which is chapter 18. So chapter 18 is now damages. And so you've entered into a contract. You are... Um, one side of you guys breaks the contract. So what's gonna happen now? This is something you should write down. The most common remedy available for breach is monetary damages. So again, the most common remedy when there is a breach is monetary damages. And what does that mean? If there's a breach in a contract, most people just want money to make them whole by getting granted a certain amount of money from the court or in a settlement that makes them whole as if the contract had actually been performed. Now, sometimes money is not good enough. Sometimes there are other avenues that are considered remedies, and that is either specific performance or an injunction, and I'm going to go over those. So sometimes specific performance is what you want. I don't want no stinking money. I want you to do what you were supposed to do. And I'll give you an example from that. Um, let's say you were buying a, uh, a car. If you're a car buff, and I don't know anything about cars, so this might not be the best example, but you found this car in this slot, it's an antique car, a 1950, 40 Chevrolet with original rims and parts and lights and leather seats and the original radio, one of a kind. And this person who owned it entered into a contract with you to sell it for you for $50,000. I don't even know if this car exists. I just made it up. And you entered into a contract. You put down a deposit. And you were supposed to go pick up the car, you know, a week later with the rest of the money. You go. And he's like, you know what? I'm going to give you your money back. I'm not going to be able to sell it to you. Would you getting your money back make you feel better? You want that car you later find out he actually found somebody that was going to pay a little bit more. And regardless of whether or not that's true, you entered into a contract for that specific car. Money is not going to make you whole. That car is what you want. So sometimes in a contract, the remedy is um, you want specific performance. You want to happen what the parties agreed to happen. The other uh, type of remedy is injunction. And it's actually the opposite of specific performance. Sometimes you want somebody to stop doing something that they had entered into a contract for or that they um, were, were doing or whatever. So let's say your neighbor is building an in-ground pool and the, the water and they're digging and all that stuff, it's running, it's creating a whole turbulent action and it's coming into your yard. You go to court and you, you, you ask for an injunction. You want them to stop whatever it is that they're doing. So an injunction is stopping something. Specific performance is you want that specific thing to actually happen. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you for acknowledging my presence. And Sorry. now you, you know, so those are the, you know, different types of, of remedies. But now, like, how, how do we actually calculate damages? How does the court decide all right, here's how much money you're actually going to be granted. And there's a couple of different ways. So it could be whatever you were supposed to get had the contract had gone through. Okay. It, it's, it might be, you know, whatever the, you were supposed to get had the contract actually been completed. Um, it could also be calculated based on um, a, I'm sorry. Could it be a uh, precedent could be used? Um, 
depending. I guess it, it depends on the nature of the case because usually when it's a contract dispute, you're looking at the contract itself. And so contracts could be different. I guess if you have a similar case, you can look at it to see, you know, what was calculated or where it was done. Typically speaking, you won't have punitive damages in contract disputes because punitive damages are meant to punish somebody. We're doing so good, right? But now it's just, you know, uh, it just has to start. <laughs> um, so punitive damages are, are punishment. So there's a number of ways to actually calculate um how to make somebody whole. And there's there's actually, I'm going, let's say I'm gonna actually have to use my whiteboard for this. So, and again, I don't know, if, well, we'll try, we'll see. So let's say I am a builder. No, I, I contract somebody to build something for me, right? I want him to build a apartment building or actually let's make it a hotel. And the hotel is supposed to have, uh, it's gonna be 10 rooms in it. And at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So in every room, once I'm actually able to, um, you know, rent it out, I'm supposed to be able to get, let's say it's a hundred dollars for each room per night. Okay, per night. And I tell the builder I need this done by December twentieth um, because I want to be able to rent it out for New Year's Eve. So when I have my, my building operational, uh, every month I pay, let's say $500 in overhead costs. Okay, Ugh. torture. So if I, we're not even gonna do $100 a night, we're gonna just do $100 a month because that's just gonna be easier. So let's do $100, $100 a month for each room. So if I'm full at capacity, $100 a month for each room, I have 10 rooms. How much is gonna is that going to be? A grand. $1,000. And I <clears throat> said, I'm going to, so if I'm at full capacity, I'm going to be making $1,000 a month, but I'm also going to be subtracting the $500 in cost per month. So let's say the builder does not deliver this to me by December 20th, like I wanted. They actually deliver it, ready, delivered January, one month late. How much money can I recoup from the builder? Uh, would it be 500? Because Yes, it would. Because you would make a thousand dollars and you would have, but you would have to... <clears throat> but it, you wouldn't have to pay out for the overhead costs. Exactly, exactly. So the court's not gonna give you a windfall. They're not gonna give you the thousand dollars because they're also gonna take into account how would you have been made whole? You would have been made whole if this was delivered in December, you were able to rent it out and you would have made a maximum of $500. So that's how uh, it could be calculated. So it's the cost, um, that's just one way, like there's different definitions and different ways to calculate things, but I'm just, you know, if I ask you something with an example like that, it'll be based on like, right, the examples that we discussed in class and I'll give you a very specific example. Usually I, I'll ask like one question like that. Um, again, you wanna keep in mind, it's not gonna be, you know, a windfall for one side, it's going to be what the, just to be made whole. You don't wanna exceed that, you just wanna be made whole. Um, let me see, what else do I have here on the syllabus? Okay, who read was Hadley versus Baxendale? I can talk about this one. Okay, tell me. <clears throat> so in this case, the plaintiffs operated a flour mill and a really important piece of equipment in the machinery broke. I think it was the crankshaft. Uh, because this piece of equipment broke, the flour mill could no longer operate. They actually had to shut down operations. And so they used a common carrier what they call the common carrier to transport the piece for repairs, but they did not communicate to the carriers the urgency of having this piece repaired. The carrier promised that the shaft would be delivered the next day um, and they collected their freight charges. Um, <clears throat> transport ended up being delayed and it caused the mill to remain down for several days resulting in profit loss. 
They sued for damage, but found that since the urgency wasn't communicated properly, the damages were unrecoverable. Excellent, excellent. This is a very, very old case. It's like 1800s, I think. And the point of this case is foreseeability of damages. It was not foreseeable for the company that was making this or sending this thing out that, you know, the entire mill would have to shut down because they didn't have this particular piece. Had they known that, then it would have been on them to like expedite it or not use a common carrier or do whatever. They thought that this, you know, mill had another piece, you know, had a spare or something. So they could not fathom. It was not foreseeable that this whole operation was not going to work. So foreseeability of damages is another way to calculate how much money somebody would get. And it's based on whether or not um, the harm suffered was foreseeable or not. Good, very good. Now, the next case uh, also is uh, interesting, and that's Parker versus 20th Century Fox. Uh, I can talk about this one. Um... Go ahead. The, this actress, Parker, something, I don't remember her full name, but uh, she was an actress in the 60s and she was recruited for a movie by 20th Century Fox for, and she was guaranteed uh, $750,000 uh, among other things in her contract, but 20th Century Fox decided to not produce that movie and instead have her star in this different movie uh, and she would get her $750,000 but she would lose some of the other conditions in her contract, notably not being able to uh, not weigh in on who was directing the movie. Mm -hmm. So she opted to not uh, not uh, do that movie and she sued for breach of contract on the original movie. And 20th Century Fox tried to say, uh, well, she could have taken the $750,000 from, $750, from this other movie, so she, but she didn't, so she doesn't really have a case. And I think the judge sided with the actress. Right. Do you remember the differences in the two movies? Um, you did great. You did great. So, Off the top I'll, of my head, no. The first one, do you remember, Jessica? Uh, the first one, I just remember it was supposed to be filmed in California. The second one was a Western that was supposed to be filmed in Australia. The first one was a musical. Oh, first it was one a musical. musical, that's right. That's yeah. right. I yeah. remember it was called Blooming Girl. That's all I got. Yeah. So the first one was a musical and there was going to be singing and dancing and she was going to show off her skills. The second one was a Western and she was not going to be able to do the things that she wanted to do. And there are very few cases that I personally don't agree with. And that's one of them. But the reasoning behind the court's decision is she opted for, she agreed to perform this. She was going to have the say in the director. She was going to be dancing. She was like a singer. And it was this happy, you know, musical kind of thing. And now you're changing the entire genre. Perhaps if she had gone and did this, you know, Western it was going to set her career back. Perhaps when she accepted this original contract, she turned down other offers. And so she should have gotten paid because she, you know, she turned down other things. Maybe she was picky about the things that she wanted to do. So the court said that you did not give her something of equal nature. It was inferior in nature, what you offered her. And that's why she was entitled to the 750000 any questions on anyone? Anyone? Okay. Uh, I'm going to just look at my notes, see if there's anything else. Injunction. Okay. So that basically is everything I want you to know that covers um, all those different chapters. Um, I will put this up tonight. I'll send you the link, but I noticed that when I actually put things up on Blackboard, you don't actually get it at that time. Usually you get it like a few hours later, sometimes even a day later. So I'm going to try to put this up, um, at least get it ready so I can put it up tonight. And I'm going to work on your exam over the next two to two, three days. I should have it finalized before the weekend. So if you, if one of you uh, is very curious about how many questions and whatnot, if you want to send me an email, that way I could remember to email the class and tell you it's going to be this number, of, but it's not going to, it's going to be the range of between 20 and 30 multiple choice and five and 10 true and false. And that's it. It's going to be open book. Like the first exam, you have to sign on uh, at Blackboard at 630 next week. Do, you know, again, check your internet, check all that jazz. Um, once you start, you must finish. It is an open book. Um, 
and I, you know, for sometimes, you know, you have questions during the exam. For those of you who did before, if you email me, I respond right back. Some questions I can't answer because it's, you know, like I'm not, I can't answer. You have to just kind of do your best, but you always have to just select uh, the best answer for the question. And yes, the exam is next week. If you refer to the syllabus, it has it um, that it is next week. So it's going to cover chapters nine through 18. So it's only, you know, nine chapters. It's all about the wonderful world of contracts. Make sure you understand the concept. You're going to have from 6.30 to, I guess, 9 or 9.15 to answer that. Most of you will be finished in a very short period of time. There will not be you know, class afterwards, so you can enjoy the evening whenever you're done. Anybody, any questions? Okay, so I'm gonna just stop the recording.